great. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I hope everyone enjoyed this morning's presentations. Uh, they certainly provided a really beautiful introduction to what I'm going to be sharing with you. We heard uh, multiple strategies to essentially manipulate and then harness the strength of the immune response, uh, whether that's through an adoptive T cell therapy or a cancer vaccine, apologies for that phrasing, <laughs> uh, or an oncolytic virus. All of these strategies require an understanding of what it is the immune system is recognizing so that you, the scientist, can exploit that and then enhance the response. So I'm going to be using some case studies from both gene therapy and immune oncology programs to demonstrate different tools for identifying what it is the immune system is recognizing, uh, the epitopes, as well as how to characterize and then track responses against those epitopes from your patients. Okay, so just a very general and uh, quick immunology background, as we've seen this a couple of times already today. Uh, but both the class one and class two antigen processing pathways are shown uh, here. And I'm going to be focusing on the class one pathway, which involves the processing of intracellular material, like a viral or cancer protein, into smaller peptides, typically eight to 11 amino acids in length. Those peptides are then presented by an MHC class one molecule to a T cell receptor on a CD8 T cell. So you can see why it's very important to identify what these antigenic peptides are, because uh, they, of course, activate your CD8s, which then triggers the subsequent cytotoxic response. And once you've identified what those epitopes are, you can then implement them into your programs to help improve the specificity of the therapy, as well as reduce the lead time in vaccine and immunotherapy development. They serve as candidates uh, for possible reengineering options to enhance or dampen the immune response when necessary. And they, of course, allow for uh, detailed and very accurate immune uh, monitoring programs. And in the context of today's case study, they can be used to track responses to a viral vector, a CAR-T construct, for example, or a neoantigen. All right. So there are several different tools for T-cell epitope epitope discovery, and what Permune will do will help determine the best strategy based on the program objectives and then what resources you have available to you, whether that's uh, clinical samples from a novel uh, cancer immunotherapy or maybe you just have a sequence from a virus that you want to characterize further. So I'm going to be focusing on the antigen presentation and MHC peptide binding assays for tools for ep uh, epitope discovery, but you see I have a few others listed here that I did want to mention briefly. Many people will use in silico prediction tools as a first pass, um, as they're generally pretty good for class one. Programs like IEDB and the CIFPYTHI uh, are also free and don't require the use of any material. Of course, these are prediction algorithms, so there are limitations. You can also use functional assays like intercellular cytokine staining and T cell LE spots for uh, T cell epitope discovery. And this you would typically use, uh, as Daniel mentioned, a, a matrix-style peptide pooling approach in which you do several rounds of analysis to elucidate the minimal 9 or 10 mer sequence that elicits the response. And um, again, this can take several rounds and can be a very lengthy process as well as very cell intensive. But I am going to be talking about T-cell LA spots in the context of uh, an immune monitoring tool, specifically to track antigen-specific responses. Um, to, to individual peptides or peptide pools from um, detected by one of these other assays. Also be talking about some data generated by Pro5 Pentamers to detect antigen-specific CD8 T cells in immune monitoring programs as well. Okay, so I'll begin with the ProPresent antigen presentation assay, which has already been uh, introduced once today. But it's used to identify naturally processed and presented peptides from your protein of interest in the context of an MHC molecule. And this is a very powerful tool that uses mass spectrometry to identify the epitopes from both the class one and class two processing pathways in just a matter of a few weeks. And um, <clears throat> again, we'll be talking about the class one processing and specifically intracellular material. And then you'll hear more about class two presentation tomorrow from Jeremy in the context of immunogenicity assessment. So we have several publications that feature the ProPresent assay, and I'm going to be going through a few of these as case studies, and then you'll hear more about them again tomorrow. Okay, so the ProPresent assay is uh, essentially a two-step process. The first is generation of the cells that have been exposed to an antigen in some form or another, while the second is then the recovery and identification of the peptides presented from that antigen. 
and we can generate cells and then exogenously load material onto them like a therapeutic protein or an antibody, which again is what Jeremy will be discussing, or we can work with a wide variety of cell types that have already seen the antigen and are coming to us as frozen cell pellets. And what I think speaks to the versatility of this assay is the very long uh, list of both cell and antigen sources that can be assessed in this assay. Uh, some examples include tumor tissue, cells from healthy donors that may have been vaccinated, uh, cells from your patient samples that may have been treated with a DNA or RNA-based uh, therapeutic. For the case studies today, you'll see how tumor cell lines have been used, as well as uh, cells transduced with a viral vector. Just as long as your cell of interest has that uh, class one or class two on, on the surface. So once we receive those um, frozen pellets, we can do an immunoprecip uh, immunoprecipitation step, pulling down the MHC peptide complex. And if you're interested in class one, we would use the pan class one antibody. We then recover those peptides and sequence them using mass spectrometry. So we'll create a database that contains the human proteome and then the sequences from your protein of interest, whether that's the viral or cancer protein. And then we'll report to you all of the peptides from the, uh, those proteins of interest. We can also search for specific mutations. So if you do have the tumor tissue and have done exome sequencing, we can incorporate that into the database and then search for those mutated sequences or neoantigens. We can also look for peptide modifications like post-translational modifications as well as phosphorylation, for example. Okay. So the first case study comes from the German Cancer Center and Oryx, an oncolytic virus company, and their use of the ProPresent assay to identify epitopes from their oncolytic parvovirus therapy. And as we've already heard, oncolytic viruses are very uh, promising immunotherapy as they help to turn on the immune uh, system by selectively replicating in the cancer cells and then eliciting an anti-tumor specific response. And those anti-tumor responses can be further enhanced uh, when an immune stimulatory gene is inserted into the viral genome or when it's given in combination with checkpoint inhibitors, for example. There are several different oncolytic viruses that are being explored in this particular study is with an H1PV rodent protoparvovirus. And this is non-pathogenic in humans. It's very small. It uh, causes direct oncolysis and immune-mediated effects. And they're exploring this H1PV in their parv oryx therapy of a phase 1-2A for glioblastoma multiform, which is the most common primary brain tumor in, consisting of about 2 to 3 percent of all human malignancies. And unfortunately, there's a very poor prognosis with about half of the patients dying within the first 16 months and less than 5 percent who experience long-term survival. So very clear and evident need for a focused and very advanced therapy. The objective of this study was to identify parvoviral and tumor epitopes that could be used to monitor the patient responses to the therapy in the clinic, uh, but they had very few cells to work with, and those were uh, reserved for the immune monitoring portion. So they uh, were very creative with their solution in that they used parvovirus-infected glioblastoma cell lines that were matched to the patient's HLA type uh, for the epitope discovery. They provided us with those cells, and we did the PAN class 1 analysis and created a database that had uh, the protein sequences from the parvovirus as well as from glioma. And we identified five unique peptides from the um, two different parvoviral proteins and 20 peptides from 18 different glioma proteins. After identifying the viral and cancer epitopes, uh, we could then track patient responses against those in the clinic. And to do so, we used a T cell LA spot. And again, we have already heard about this, so I just have a brief background. Uh, LA spots are essentially an assay standard for monitoring T cell responses, as well as validating T cell epitopes. They're a very robust and highly reproducible assay that measures cytokine uh, production at the single cell level following antigen stimulation. With an experienced LA spot handler, uh, you can detect very rare T cell precursor frequencies, as low as one cell in every 100,000, given that there's uh, low background in that assay. You can assess multiple different cytokines, and I'll be focusing on interferon gamma. You can also look at multiple different antigen um, as the, the stimulant, and that can include peptides, peptide pools, or whole proteins. And those peptide pools can consist of uh, maybe a handful of immunodominant peptides or a larger library of overlapping uh, peptides like 15 mers. Typically, whole PBMCs are used in LA spots as you can um, measure both the CD8 and the CD4 T cell responses, 
But of course, you can further purify those populations and look at them individually by using the appropriately sized peptide. And then I'll say this now and then again later, just how important the cell quality is in an LA spot assay. Uh, it's very important the cells are processed in a very timely manner following blood draw. Uh, and then a robust cryopreservation technique is used. So later on in the presentation, you'll hear uh, some optimization studies that we can provide to ensure that we are working with the highest quality of cells possible and that the assay is essentially tailored, uh, tailored to your specific program. So we are using cryopreserved PBMCs in this overnight assay. We plate 250,000 cells per well in triplicate per antigen. So it can be a cell intensive assay based on the number of antigens that you're interested in. We run the equivalent of three antigens in the form of controls, uh, including a media only negative control, PHA as a positive control, as well as CEF, which is an immunodominant peptide pool from CMV, EBV, and influenza. And then following that overnight incubation, we uh, count the interfering gamma producing cells using an automated LA spot plate reader. So going back to that case study, uh, this group was interested in searching for uh, both a combined intratumoral and intracerebral as well as IV and IC routes for their therapy. And they collected PBMCs both prior to and following the treatment and then provided us with those PBMCs to test in the LA spot assay. And we used four different antigen pools two from glioma, one consisting of peptides that have been identified by the ProPresent assay, uh, one uh, consisting of peptides pulled from the literature. There were also two parvoviral pools, one identified by ProPresent containing NS1 uh, protein peptides, the other one also presented by ProPresent or identified and containing peptides from the capsid VB1 protein. And that data set is shown here. On the y-axis, you have uh, the number of spot forming cells per million PBMCs. And then the different uh, time points for this individual donor is on the x-axis. And just a few things to point out. You can see there's very consistently low background, which is shown by the white bars. Uh, so that's something you definitely want to see in this assay, as well as consistently high and significant responses to the PHA. Uh, that's something else that you'd want to see in this assay. There were also significant responses at day 61 to all four of the antigen peptide pools. And again, three of them contain novel epitopes identified by ProPresent. Um, so in this study, they did show that the oncolytic H1PV parvovirus induced both virus and glioma-specific T cell responses. Okay, so we also have experience in using these epitope discovery and immune monitoring tools in gene therapy programs. Uh, often, AAV is used as the viral vector for the transgene, as we heard from Daniel earlier. Uh, cellular responses play a very important role and contribute to the success of these long-term gene transfer strategies. And specifically, T cell responses should be monitored as a large portion of the adult population do have neutralizing antibodies against some of these AAV serotypes. So I'm going to be sharing some data from the Children's Hospital. Uh, Philadelphia, and maybe some of you are just joining this afternoon. This was presented earlier by Daniel. Uh, but briefly, they used hepatocytes that had been transduced with AAV2 vector, encoding either the capsid alone or human factor 9, as this is a treatment for hemophilia. And we did the um, class 1 analysis, and that data set is shown here using the ProPresent assay. Uh, and there's one uh, specific peptide here that's showing up in both samples. And I believe they did also show that this did elicit functional CD8 T cell responses, which was confirmed in their LA spot analysis. Okay, so LA spots are commonly used to track patient responses in gene therapy programs. And typically that's against uh, the vector, the viral vector, or the transgene, uh, maybe the CAR T construct. And we do have experience in this area as we have uh, completed and are currently involved in clinical trials for gene therapy programs. So I'm going to be using those as examples to detail some optimization studies that we can perform along this LA spot workflow prior to ever working with those um, precious patient samples. So the expertise that ProImmune provides really uh, assists in the very early stages by helping you to understand the limitations of your own study and the scope of work that we can provide. So for example, if you are planning to draw a very low volume of blood from your patients, 
This will yield fewer cells to work with and ultimately fewer antigens that you can assess in this type of assay. So once that has been determined and uh, identified, then we can help design and then synthesize your peptide antigens. And for an alley spot assay, we would want to work with at least greater than 85% pure peptides, if not higher. We would also do the peptide pooling and aliquoting, and we can work with uh, peptide pools that have uh, maybe an overlapping set of peptides from a single antigen, or we can do uh, fewer peptides per pool. The aliquoting is also very important, as the clinical samples are typically run in batches. And so an appropriately sized aliquot will help to reduce the uh, waste of the peptide after it's been reconstituted, as well as ensure that sufficient amount of peptides will be available for the duration of the study. So after those peptides have been synthesized, we can begin those optimization studies. And one of the first things we would recommend is to identify a positive donor that can be run alongside your clinical samples. So we have a ProMune PBMC biobank that consists of PBMCs that have been collected from healthy altruistic donors in the UK. And they're fully typed for class two and have been cryopreserved as they are typically used in our immunogenicity assessment tools. And we can select a panel of these donors and then screen them in an LA spot assay against your desired antigen. And if there are any positive um, donors or donors who respond positively to that specific antigen, we can reserve those cells and then run them alongside additional observation studies as well as the clinical samples. So we have done that for gene therapy programs, and I have an example here in which um, we identified a donor who responded positively to a specific antigen peptide pool. We then reserved those cells and ran them alongside the subsequent LA spot runs. And this is the data for 10 LA spots. So I'll just uh, point out that again, the media only control elicited very, very low responses, so very nice low background. Also consistent responses against the positive PHA control. And then you see very consistent responses against the ant uh, antigen peptide pool as well. So this donor's cells did serve as an additional assay control. And in this particular program, uh, it was very useful as it helped to tease out some issues that the group was having with some of the clinical samples in terms of the cell uh, viability and functionality. Okay, and that brings me to another uh, optimization study that we can perform, which is the qualification of any third-party cell processing or cryopreservation protocols. So clinical trials are happening all over the world, and that is true also for where the blood is being drawn and the cells are being processed. So this typically occurs in multiple sites, and Permune can help to establish a cohesive protocol to be used among those sites, uh, because even the tiniest of details can make a major difference in the cell viability and functionality. Uh, that can include a, an additional centrifugation step or even the type of tube that's being used. Once those protocols have been established, then the processing site can do a dry run and draw blood from a healthy individual and send those to us for LA spot analysis using your, your particular peptides. Uh, and this, of course, evaluates several steps in that process, including the processing of the cells the freezing of the cells, and even then shipping the cells across the Atlantic, all the things that you'd want to have uh, in place prior to working with those clinical samples. We can also do cell limiting uh, assays, so reducing the number of cells plated per well to determine the minimal number of cells required to uh, see a response against your desired antigen, and then use that information to create a sample analysis plan or a prioritization schedule so that when our assay scientists uh, go to thaw your clinical samples, if there aren't enough cells to run the full scope of the project, then they can refer to this prioritization schedule that's been predetermined and uh, eliminates uh, necessary steps, whether that's reducing the number of replicates or the number of cells plated per well, or even uh, taking out a positive control. And then finally, we can perform intra and intra or inter assay variability studies. And this is something we did when we first established the assay in-house. We uh, assessed two different LA spot handlers over three days for a total of six LA spots. And again, you see that we had routinely low background levels, so less than 20 spot, form, spot forming cells per million. We also see consistent uh, data sets against the positive control in both of the test peptides. So this validation report is um, available, and we can also perform this type of assay uh, and we have done so for gene therapy programs using the particular peptides that are going to be used in the clinical trial.
Okay, so the immune monitoring aspect of your study is uh, obviously extremely important and can yield very powerful results. So it is critical to consider these different aspects along this LESpot workflow um, to ensure that, again, the highest quality of cells are being used, as well as to perform these necessary optimization and qualification studies. And at ProImmune, we do have expertise at all of these different stages of the LESpot workflow including the handling of the clinical samples themselves, uh, the receipt, the storage, as well as the analysis, and then, of course, the reporting. All right, so this brings me to the third case study, which comes from the University of Helsinki, Finland, in which we used an LA spot analysis um, to measure tumor-specific responses in an adenovirus cancer gene therapy study. And here, the uh, adenovirus was expressing uh, human GMCSF, which is one of the most potent inducers of anti-tumor immunity, and the, that's as because it um, attracts NK cells to the tumor site as well as induces uh, tumor-specific CTLs. So 20 PBMC samples from patients with advanced tumors that had been treated with this AD5D24 GMCSF was measured in an LA spot assay in which we used two different antigen pools, including a peptide pool from Survivin consisting of 33 peptides and a peptide pool from AD5, uh, which had 140 overlapping 15 MERS. And you can see that they did detect some tumor-specific responses in some of the patients. And if you'll note here at the date, this was really one of the earlier studies to identify any tumor-specific responses using uh, an adenovirus um, gene therapy. Okay, so the assays I've described thus far have used cells to identify T cell epitopes, uh, but you may be in the very early stages or may not have those resources available to you. And so we do have a cell-free system for T cell epitope discovery, uh, and that's our MHC peptide binding assay called Reveal. And this is a high-throughput physical binding assay, so this does help to eliminate some of the inaccuracies that can be associated with in silico approaches. It does rapidly identify the T cell epitopes from your protein of interest, as well as the precise HLA restriction of those epitopes. And we have this available for 13 different human uh, class 1 alleles, as well as 56 alleles for class 2. And this is also available for mice and non-human primates for class 1. It's a modular platform uh, consisting of four modules. The first is the synthesis of the peptides to be used in the binding assay. And we can do this in a very uh, high throughput, cost-effective manner. The module two is the binding assay itself. So we combine those uh, peptides we synthesized with a recombinant MHC molecule of interest, uh, beta 2M, and then this is in the presence of a conformational antibody. So this antibody will only bind given the appropriate configuration of this complex. And when this occurs, a uh, fluorescent signal is generated, and we use that to create a binding score relative to a, uh, a known T cell epitope for that same allele that we run in parallel. And then anything that is a strong binder, we can then synthesize a pentamer, which I'll discuss uh, in more detail in just a bit. And then the fourth module are the kinetics analysis, so we can do a, a more depth, in-depth characterization using our on and off rate assays. Okay, so the fourth case study comes from the University of Pittsburgh uh, using the reveal binding assay to identify CD8 T cell epitopes from a human herpes virus 8, which is the most common cancer among HIV infected individuals. And a hallmark of herpes viruses, of course, are the latent and lytic life cycles. And the lytic proteins for this particular herpes virus is uh, known to be associated with um, enhanced angiogenesis of the endothelial cells which is where the tumor is derived. And that CD8 T cells play a very important role in controlling the viral infection as well as the virus replication. So the purpose of this study was to identify both latent and lytic epitopes that could be used as biomarkers uh, to track the individuals with the virus who did or did not develop the cancer. Okay. Um, and before I get into the data set, as Jeremy mentioned earlier, I am uh, a co-author in this particular study. And um, I mentioned in the very beginning that T cell LE spots can be used in the epitope discovery process, but it could be a very lengthy and time consuming process. I also use a lot of your cells. Well, myself, as well as the primary author, Dr. Lapone, spent probably the first uh, year and a half of our graduate program on this particular study doing LA spots. We were screening HHV8 seronegative and seropositive donors, and we were using individual epitopes, individual peptides, 
from four different proteins. So if you know anything about herpes viruses, they're huge. So that's a lot of peptides, which resulted in a lot of LA spot plates. We were also doing um, week-long DC enhanced co-cultures, so not the typical overnight stimulation. So this uh, took a very long time. And this is a perfect example of how the binding assay could have been used in the very early stages of this project uh, to identify the precise epitopes from those four proteins. So I imagine uh, handing our PI a data report in about six weeks, we would have looked like rock stars. But um, we were cheap labor, we were grad students. So after many, many, many alley spots, we did narrow down to uh, 10 novel epitopes that Permune ran in an A2 binding assay, as well as uh, five previously published epitopes. And that data set is shown here, and this is the percent of binding relative to the positive control. So everything that's marked with a star was considered a strong binder, and that includes two of the novel epitopes and then three of the previously published. Also marked with a star, uh, these sequences were then synthesized into pentamers. Uh, and again, the pentamers are a flow cytometry tool that can be used uh, to track antigen-specific CD8 T cells. And that pentameric structure is shown here. Uh, this consists of five MHC peptide complexes configured through a coiled-coiled domain, and then five fluorescent tags. So those fluorescent tags can be APC or RPE, or unique to the pentamer, uh, you can use biotin. And of course, this gives you flexibility with your staining panel in that you can use uh, whatever color you choose, conjugated to streptavidin. Also uh, unique to the pentamers are that they can be unlabeled, and these can be frozen down and have an extended shelf life of a year. So you can imagine if you're using uh, the pentamers to stain your cohort, that you can, you can order a large amount in the very beginning, receive those, um, QC them, aliquot them, and freeze them down, and then you can continue to use those for the duration of your study with um, fewer QC steps, so you're saving those precious cells, and uh, of course they're lasting for a very long time. We, all, we have over 450 catalog specificities, and over 200 of those are cancer specific. We're constantly adding to this catalog in both specificity and allele type that's available. And if we don't have your particular specificity, we can synthesize a custom pentamer, which takes about four to six weeks. And um, what I think speaks to, to the consistency of this reagent, other than the um, other than what we've heard from people mentioning them earlier today, are the number of scientific publications, which is now over 1,600. And this uh, listed a few here, around 232 that are cancer specific, 14 from AAV, and 15 from vaccinovirus. And again, um, I have a publication in the cancer specific field. And again, we had Promune make these five A2 restricted HHV8 pentamers, and then we used them to stain the CD8s of the HHV8 seronegative and seropositive individuals. And we did find significant percentages of LANA and K.1 specific CD8 T cells, which, uh, which was then used to track um, the individuals who did develop the cancer. Okay, the last case study comes from Oxford Biomedica, in which they used the pentamers for validation of their novel CD8 T cell epitopes in colorectal pa um, cancer patients that had been vaccinated with Trovax. And Trovax consists of a recombinant vaccinia virus that encodes the tumor associated antigen 5T4, which is expressed on high levels of solid tumors and is associated with a poor prognosis. Uh, they originally had identified epitopes using binding assays, so we then synthesized a peptide library for them so they could validate those, ap um, those epitopes using an LA spot. And this is their data set here, both pre and post vaccination. So, really nice um, uh, LA spots. We also then made 10 different pentamers for them uh, to track their 5T4 specific CD8 T cells in their patient population. And here in the upper right quadrant, you have the 5T4 antigen specific CD8 T cells uh, pre vaccination, which is 0.01%, and post vaccination, which goes up to 0.22%. So, really nice, strong data here as well. Okay, so I've been talking about uh, class one. Um, throughout this entire presentation, but let's not forget that class two is also important, especially in immune oncology programs. And uh, for that, we do have reagents to detect antigen-specific CD4 T cells, which are um, pro T2 MHC class two tetramers. These can come with uh, an APC or RPE label, and we have 132 catalog specificities. Those related to uh, cancer, uh, those antigens are listed here. 
And again, if we don't have your um, specificity of interest, we can do a custom synthesis. And then we also have biotinylated monomers available for these sequences as well. Okay, so in summary, successful epitope discovery and immune monitoring for immune oncology and gene therapy programs really require a detailed and efficient characterization of antigen-specific and anti-tumor epitopes. And it's very important to have access uh, to a wide range of these specialist assays and tools to help make those decisions appropriately and in a very uh, quick manner as the field is always progressing quite rapidly. So we offer these tools as an integrated platform so that you can essentially pick and choose the um, platform that best addresses your questions that you're asking, which ultimately saves you time and money and reduces your overall project risk. So we have a lot of experience working with a lot of different types of molecules, and some of those are uh, summarized here, and you've heard a few of them today, and then you hear a lot more about these tomorrow. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Everyone's an expert now, yeah. <laughs> so how big is the... I can hear you. So, you know, for MSC class 2 peptide, uh, for MSC peptide binding assay, normally go up to like 15 uh, mer amino acid sequence. How far you have tested, you know, because sometimes the peptides are as big as 30 or 34 amino acids. Uh, have you tested that big of a peptide, or is there any way you can test and see if it can bind to the MSC uh, during the MSC peptide binding assays? Yeah, so I can answer that. Sorry, sure, yeah, yeah that's um, fine. Yeah, so we, we, we can look at that. I guess the question is that from the point of view of when you look at presenting peptides, you do get a very wide range of presentation length. The vast majority. <laughs> The vast majority tends to be um, <coughs> typically, yeah, that sort of 11, well, usually sort of 30, 12, 13, up to 15, 16, 17 amino acids in length. But there are certain occasions where you do sort of see longer peptides being naturally presented to, for example, the antigen presentation assay. But the question is whether that is um, just a peptide that is just on the surface of the MHC molecule that's just been eluted and sequenced, or whether actually I um, mean, you know, it's maybe been loaded onto the cell depending on how it's been treated, or whether that's actually a naturally processed and presented epitope. So you can, with the um, MHC peptide binding assays, do that synthetic th sequence, uh, synthetic generation of peptides, and look at the length if you wanted to. So typically, when you do get those long peptides, actually the minimal epitope is within that. So you just need to sort of reduce the length until it sort of doesn't bind anymore. And you can see that quite easily by doing overlapping sequences and seeing the optimal binding. Hi, I'm just wondering, in the first study that you cited in oncolytic virus, uh, how was the information of the CD8 epitope mapping used by the team? I was just, I'm just wondering, why yeah. would you, why, why did they spend this effort into The glioblastoma study? Yeah, mapping the CD8 epitopes of a virus. Those, um, yeah, those peptides were what were put into a pool that we then used in the LA spot assay. So we use the ProPresent assay to identify what peptides are being presented from that virus as well as the cancer. And then those were incorporated into individual peptide pools that were used in the patient samples to track the responses against the therapy they were receiving. So I, can say, I can say a bit more about that. So sure. I think um, the, the virus itself didn't have any sort of immuno, separately immunogenic cargo in it. So as, as far as uh, glioma responses was concerned, they, they didn't really know how to m monitor them uh, appropriately or which proteins. And, you know, if, if they knew some peptides to, to, to use in Ellisport type assays, then, uh, you know, that they felt that would be a good way of setting up an immune monitoring strategy. Um, and uh, the ProPresent assay was done on cell lines that um, were provided by them because, I mean, this was before the phase one, so patient samples weren't available, and we just looked at database information, and that's how we identified those peptides, and it was fortunate that, uh, you know, they could actually see some increase in those glioma antigen-specific responses in the trial samples, you know, fo following the identification in, in, in the assay, so it, it just gives them a biomarker for something simple to look for, let's say. 
So is it possible that you already answered to my question that, so in the pro present, do you use a pan class one and or pan class two, right? So unless you have a uh, homozygous cell line for those alleles, then you won't be able to actually go back to the MHC that was loaded with the specific peptide. And even if it's uh, homozygous, you still have free class one and free class two. So how do you reconstruct that? Yeah, so we, yeah, we were using the pan class one. For class two, we do use specific antibodies like um, HLA-DR, DPDQ. Uh, and I believe we can also use A2 antibodies for the class one, but um, knowing the precise HLA restriction of the individuals who were pretend, um, presenting that peptide, you're correct. Those were, could be any of those class one. It's a technical question. So you can do the pro-present assay on any type of cells, right? Do you have limit limitation? Is it limited by the, uh, the level of expression of uh, MHC class one or class two? Because these cells might vary. When we use APCs, we know yeah, you these, need the expression is going to be high. Then have you encountered some situation where cells do not express enough um, MHCs to be able to pull them and run the assay? Yeah, I can yeah. that. So Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, so when we're working with samples that have come from the client, where they might be the transduced hepatocytes, or there might be a cell line that's been um, transfected with mRNA, or whatever it might, whatever it might be, um, then yes, ultimately, obviously, if there's not any MHC on the surface, then there's nothing to look at. So what we tend to do there is we have um, a, a broader set of, um, alle of, of protein families that we search the peptides from. So if, the pep if those cell lines are then presenting peptides from those broad um, protein families that range in abundance, so sort of transcription factors right at the bottom to, um, I guess, some other, I can't remember exactly which family it is, but the very top, I think um, you get to sort of related mm -hmm. families, things like that. Then actually that sort of shows that the, the, the relative um, expression of those MHC molecules presenting peptides is sufficient. But that's not the only thing I guess is also about the overall number of identified peptides, so house, not just housekeeping, as a, just, yeah, an endogenous peptides that are identified. So those are typically very, very strong in number, you know, you get a high number. So with MHC class one, you're typically looking at hundreds of thousands of peptides representing tens of thousands of different proteins, whereas for class two, it's a lot lower. It's usually, um, uh, t you know, sort of basically tens of thousands of peptides overall from thousands of different proteins. So for MHC class one, it is a little bit more like looking for a needle in a haystack, but um, you also have the advantage that pro, you know, all cells apart from red blood cells are, 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 are expressing class one. But yeah, for class two, you have to be pretty careful with making sure that the, the class two, um, if you're providing cells to us, haven't down-regulated that, otherwise it would be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Mm -hmm.